Praise the Lord. Everybody, I said, praise the Lord. We stand up to pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you at this time. We thank you because the entrance of your word gives light. I will thank you because of all the studies we're having in a study of the book of Joshua. And you have said this book will not depart out of our mouth, but will meditate therein day and night, that we may observe to do according to all that is written therein, for then will make our way prosperous, and then will have good success. Lord, we pray everything we read and study at this time will show us the path we ought to take in Jesus' name. We have the land of promise ahead of us. We have the land of Canaan ahead of us. The land of rest ahead of us. The land that is friend with milk and honey. And Lord, we pray you lead us into this land in Jesus' name. All the preparations we need, the readiness we ought to demonstrate, you give to us in Jesus' name. And be glorified, O Lord, as your people will march on and get into this promised land. Thank you, Lord, for the answer. In Jesus' name we pray. Give me a new year. Amen. Thank you very much. You can see now. We come to an important subject at this time. As we're talking about preparation for a supernatural breakthrough. This year there's going to be a breakthrough. Supernatural breakthrough. And then the Lord is telling us. In the passage we're looking at now. We need to prepare preparation for a supernatural breakthrough supernatural breakthrough that means exploits that means passing through the impossible that means accomplishing the impossible all these are possible in our lives a ministry but there must be a necessary preparation and a chapter before us as we come to Joshua chapter 3. This chapter before us is instructive as well as encouraging. God had promised. Yes, he had even given the land unto them. He gave them in promise to these children of Israel. But Jordan, overflowing Jordan stood between them and the fulfillment of the promise and it's like that in our lives there is the promise there is the land flowing with milk and honey there is the certainty of what god said he will do and yet you'll find between here and there between the place where you are today and the place is taking you to tomorrow. There is an impassable Jordan. A formidable obstacle. A great, great river. That you are thinking, how will I ever cross from here to there? That's why we're looking at this. That is the breakthrough. The supernatural breakthrough. So that you'll be able to move from where you are. To where you ought to be. And this Jordan will clear before you. Between God's promise. And the gracious and the great possession. Often times, many times. There stands a formidable obstacle. A barrier. A river Jordan. Something that stands between you. And the realization of that great promise of God. But as Joshua and the officers and the people of Israel, as they pass through, I'm telling you, the Lord is assuring us we're passing through. Yeah. How deep, however deep the river may be, however wide 
the river may be, however great the obstacle may be, we will pass through. But you see, Joshua had something to lean back on. Don't you remember God said, as I was with Moses, so will I be with you. As I was with Moses, here I have a river ahead of me. Did Moses have a river ahead of him? The Red Sea. And then the children of Israel cried out, What are we going to do? Here is Pharaoh and here is the army. Here is the river. Here are the mountains on both sides. And God said, Moses, stretch out your rod. And he stretched out his rod and the sea parted. And they went through. We're going through. And now, this Joshua must now remember. As I was with Moses, so will I be with you. He had the Red Sea before him. He stretched out the rod and the sea parted. Joshua, where is your rod? I don't have a rod. Think about that. As I was with Moses, so will I be with you. And Moses stretched out his rod. And I don't have a rod that I'm going to stretch on River Jordan. He is the one that gave the promise. And his methods are varied, multiple, manifold. He doesn't always use the rod. Sometimes he'll abandon the rod and use the ark. His methods are different. The point is because he has given the word. As I was with Moses, I will be with you. I divided the Red Sea and I will divide River Jordan. Don't worry about the rock. There is always an alternative. His methods are different. He doesn't do the same thing every time. River Jordan lay at the very entrance of Canaan, the promised land. Is there an insurmountable problem before you? Something you look at and say, this is a new year. How are we going to cross over? By the time we meet again, you'll give me a testimony. Yeah. You will say, you read it in the word. I believe in it in my heart. And then I went to prove it in my location. You'll prove it out. Yeah. They see in front of us is going to clear. Yeah. This obstacle ahead of us is going to clear. Yeah. All these formidable objects standing between us and the realization of the dream, the vision, the goal, the destiny, the thing the Lord has given us. All this is that you see. Everything is going to clear out of the way. Many times when the Lord calls us, he favors us and he shows us what is ahead, far away, at the end of the tunnel, at the horizon, at the end of the journey. There's no time to tell you stories. God favors some people. Many, many years ago, before deeper life ever started, that time, I didn't even, I didn't know how to even stand up before a small church, the little church I belonged to at that time, to be able to talk, talk and say anything. Even a short testimony they used to give in that church. Somebody will rise up and tell how he was saved and he had only about two, three minutes. I couldn't do it. I was so, you know, I was so shy. I couldn't talk to people. And then the Lord showed me a great multitude and all the great multitude great great sea of heads and i found myself standing up and preaching to them and the lord was telling me that is it that you look up and you look at the horizon and you look at the end of the tunnel and you look far away that is coming and then i saw that there was an obstacle between me and that realization 
how will this obstacle be cleared away? You know, every time, you don't know the way I think or what I think about. Sometimes, you know, I get on a crusade field and then I see a sea of head in the physical. Then I turn my eyes into my mind and then I see that other sea of head. I saw days gone by and I match them together then and now. I say, God, thank you. They are the same. The obstacle is taken away. The river Jordan is divided. Maybe there is something, there is a painting, there is a picture that the Lord is painting in your heart right now. And the Lord is telling you, it is coming. The breakthrough is coming. The accomplishment of the promise is coming. The manifestation of the power of God in your life, it is coming. And then you are saying, but look at me here. And look at the fulfillment there. And look at the river Jordan between me and that place. Don't worry about the river Jordan. The same God that divided the Red Sea. And that same God that divided the river Jordan. That God is still alive. As I was with Moses and I was with Joshua, so will I be with you. I will never fail you. I will never forsake you. So you may boldly say, the Lord is on my side. The Lord is with me. What can man do? This thing is going to be a reality. And you'll have a testimony. Preparation. Preparation for a supernatural breakthrough. Let me read it to you. It's in Joshua chapter 3. We're looking at verses 1 to 6. Joshua chapter 3. From verse 1. And Joshua rose early in the morning. And they moved from Shittim. And came to Jordan. He and all the children of Israel. And lodged there. Before they passed over. And it came to pass. After three days. That the officers went through the host. And they commanded the people saying. When ye see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God, and the priests, the Levites bearing it, then ye shall remove from your place and go after it. Yet there shall be a space between you and it, between you and the ark, about 2,000 cubits by measure. Come not near unto it, that ye may know the way by which ye must go. For ye have not passed this way heretofore. And Joshua said unto the people, Sanctify yourselves, for tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. And Joshua spake unto the priest, saying, Take up the ark. Of the covenant and pass over before the people, and he took up the ark of the covenant and went before the people. This passage uh, gives us the preparation that they are to make the preparation for a supernatural breakthrough. We divide the message to three parts number one, rising early and overcoming procrastination rising early and overcoming procrastination number two reflections on the ark before progress reflections on the ark before progress thinking about the ark drawing lessons from the ark reflections on the ark before progress. And then point number three. Readiness for exploits through purity. Readiness for exploits through purity. Number one, rising early and overcoming procrastination. Let's look at Joshua again. Chapter three, verse one. And Joshua rose early in the morning. How do you understand that? If you look at the last verse of chapter 2, 
The spies had just come back. And the spies gave him the information, the result of the research. They conducted, they, they, they found out. And they said, the land is ready. They are waiting for us. All their hearts have melted. And they are fainted. Because of us. Let's go on. We can do it. And they were told in the very next verse. Chapter 3 verse 1. And Joshua rose early. In the morning. And they removed from Shittim. The wilderness is going. And all the past. We're going to get done. What the past. Something new. Something great. It's going to happen. And if we're expecting it, there's something the Lord is asking you to do. Rise early. Rising early and overcoming procrastination. And Joshua rose early. By the way, this you'll find is the attitude and the response of Joshua. Chapter 6, Joshua chapter 6. We're looking at it in verse 12. And Joshua rose early in the morning, and the priest took up the ark of the Lord. Another time, this is now when they were to come around Jericho, that Joshua rose early in the morning, rising early and overcoming procrastination. That we are not looking at how big the task is, how great the difficulty is, how challenging the responsibility or duty is. That because it's great and because it's like a great mountain before you. Then you're just, you're saying, how will I do this? And you're thinking and thinking and thinking. And you're not rising up to address the issue. You know, if you're going to do something difficult, the longer you wait, the greater the mountain looks to you. The longer you wait, the longer you delay, the more difficult the task appears to you. But when you realize what must be done, must be done. We have to cross over. We cannot stay in the edge of the wilderness, in the brink of Jordan for the rest of our lives. And as we look across Jordan, we can see the promised land. And we can see the great expanse of land that the Lord had prepared for his people. We know that we must get there. Even though the difficulties are there, why don't you then address it immediately? Rise up early and then overcome procrastination. And that's exactly what he did. Immediately he had received the necessary information. Yes, you might wait for information. You might wait for instruction. You might wait for, you know, encouragement. But after you've got the information, after you've got the inspiration, after you've got everything, you're looking at the result of the investigation. Then you rise up immediately and you address the challenge that is before you. He did not entertain the habit of, I'll do it tomorrow. And then when tomorrow comes, I'll wait till tomorrow. And when tomorrow comes, I think tomorrow will be better. And tomorrow never arrives. When the Lord gives us something to do, do it immediately. And this is what we find. In all ministers, all children of God, workmen that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, you rise up immediately and you face the challenge that is before you. And if you're going to stand before the king, if you're going to do something that is worthwhile, here is the diligence you must bring to your activity. The diligence you must bring to your duty and your responsibility. We're, to, we're looking at Proverbs chapter, in Proverbs, reading there in uh, chapter 22 verse 29. Proverbs chapter 22 verse 29. See, seest thou a man diligent in his business? How do you know a diligent man? A man that rises up early. And he doesn't spend the first few hours of the morning talking. 
chatting, gossiping, just sharing some unnecessary things. How do you know a diligent man? A man that knows this is the beginning of the day. The day that is fresh. When my energy is still intact. There's no sweating yet. There is no heat yet. All my energy is still there. 100%. And at that time, when you are on the high level of energy, of vision, of enthusiasm, that's when you rise up and you give it all you've got. Rising up early. And then overcoming procrastination. Says thou, a man diligent in his business, he shall stand before kings. He shall not stand before mean men. What does procrastination do? Number one, procrastination is a thief of success. Pushing forward that thing we ought to do. Delaying that thing we ought to do. Procrastination is a thief of success. Number two, is the foundation of failure in our lives. When you cannot wake up, rise up, and address the sin that needs to be addressed. Number three is the fertilizer that makes difficulties grow. Procrastination is the fertilizer that makes our difficulties grow. You know, the difficulties are there, and then you're waiting. The more you wait, the more the difficulties will grow. No one can build a spectacular achievement or accomplishment on procrastination. No farmer ever plowed a field. No farmer ever planted the crops. No farmer ever reached a harvest by only turning it over in his mind. I'm thinking of going to the farm. I'm thinking of planting. I'm thinking of harvesting. I'm thinking, I'm turning it over in my mind. No man ever got a great thing done by just turning over in his mind. But once you see that this is what you do, you rise up immediately and get it done. That's how Joshua did it. And that's how we're going to do it. If we're going to succeed, and we're going to succeed. And if there's anything you need to break, you need to break in your life is a bad habit of procrastination. You know something about habit? Something about habit? Bad habits are easy to form, but hard to live with. Bad habits are easy to form and hard to live with. Good habits now. Good habits are hard to form. But easy to live with. Good habits. Hard to form. Sometimes it's hard to break away. From the bad habit of pushing it forward. I'll do it later. Bad habit. I'll do it later. Easy to form. But hard to live with. Because it's going to take every good thing away from you. But the good habit of rising up early. This is what you do. I must rise up and do it now. That good habit sometimes is hard to form. But if you make it a project this year. And you'll say there's something I'm going to do. I'm going to look at my life. And this habit of always pushing it forward. Pushing it forward. Pushing it forward. This year I'm breaking it right now. And if you can just do that. And just get up and do it. Somebody said it this way. He said, frogs don't look nice. And if you have two frogs to swallow, swallow the bigger one first. And then don't look at it so don't look at it too long before you swallow it. The, the, if you're looking at that frog, if you look at it too long. The description, the look of it, you'll say, whoever can swallow this one. But if you don't look at it, you know, I, if I have to swallow it, 
Don't look at it too long. Just one and take the bigger one first. You know our children. If you give them something, to, you know, they, they have food. Let's say they have a cup of tea. They also have something, bitter kind of a medicine they have to swallow. They will drink the a sweet tea first and then they'll be waiting. Mommy, do I have to swallow this other one? You know, my advice to children, my advice to children is don't look at that pill too long. Don't hold it in your hand and look, in, look at it too long. Close your eyes, put it in your mouth, leave the tea. You'll enjoy the tea later. Do the difficult part of the job first. That's a secret. And once you do that and you develop a habit of doing that, then you will overcome procrastination in a permanent way. And then the duties you are used to, that's like the tea. After you've done the difficult part of the job, now you can take that cup of tea and drink. That's how to overcome the procrastination. Because if you don't overcome it, how are you going to be able to progress in life? Now let's see. This is the habit of all people that we ever know that did anything substantial, successful in the kingdom of God. Look at Genesis chapter 20. Genesis chapter 20. I'm reading from verse 8. Genesis chapter 20 verse 8. Therefore, Abimelech rose early in the morning and called all his servants and he told all these things in their ears and the men were so afraid abimelech had taken abram's wife and god spoke to him in the dream and said you are a dead man what will i do god i don't want to die i want to live restore the man his wife that was the thing what was he to do he was to make restitution and restore the man his wife and then he rose up early that's how to do it. You rise early and you overcome procrastination. The more you delay the restitution, the bigger it will become. It will be getting to you. The more the devil will be telling you, ah, if you did that, if you do that, this is going to be the result. And this is going to be the repercussion. This is going to be the suffering. Then you delay and then when you consider the following week the devil brings a new reason again why it should not be done the more you delay the more difficult it becomes the more you delay the higher the mountain gets the bigger the problem becomes therefore abimelech rose early in the morning genesis chapter 22 what did in verse 3 and abraham rose up early in the morning and saddled his ass and took his two young men with him and isaac his son and cleared the wood for the bunch offering and rose up and went unto the place which god had told him the lord wanted him to sacrifice isaac what if he delayed the more he delayed the more a lot of questions will be rising in the mind how can God tell me to do this? Can this be the voice of God? I seek means laughter. Does God want to cancel laughter out of my mouth? Does he want to take the promised seed away from me? Can this be of God? I think I need to think this over. I need to think it through. The more you are thinking it through, the more reasons you will have not to do it. And the more you'll be giving reasons, I'm sure God will not blame me if I don't surrender this Isaac. I got this Isaac at the age of 100. I waited for him for 25 years. How can God require something like this? Must we always say yes to God and not even think it over? I think I need to discuss this matter with God. After all, in chapter 18, I discussed the matter of Sodom with God. And I said, God, the judge of all the earth, will you not do right? 
As I discussed that matter with him, can I not discuss this matter too with him? The longer you wait, the more your thoughts will be giving you a lot of reasons. But when God said, Abraham, take your son, your only son, whom you love, and you will sacrifice him to me upon a mountain. I will show you. And then the Bible says, Abraham rose up early in the morning. Becomes easier that way. Do it and do it at once. We're told in Psalm 119. Psalm 119. And I'm reading from verse 60. Psalm 119. Verse 60. In Psalm 119 verse 60. I made haste. I made haste. You know when something is actually very interesting to you. You make haste. And everybody makes haste once in a while. Even unbelievers make haste. At least they make haste to shed blood. They make haste to steal. They make, they make haste to be cruel and wicked. So once something comes in their mind. Have you noticed uh, you know, those women that divorce their husband? A little thing has happened. And a thought comes to them. I think I need to dump this man and get another man. And they make haste. And they rush for the divorce court. They make haste. Have you ever seen our children making haste? They come from school and they cannot wait. And they make haste to pick up the football. And then they're off. You can't find them again. Everybody makes haste when they're interested in doing whatever they want to do. But for us who are Christians, who are children of God... Our interest, our love, our devotion, our commitment should be unto the Lord. And we should make haste to obey and to do what the Lord had said. It says in number 60, I made haste and delayed not rising early and overcoming procrastination. To keep, I delayed not to keep thy commandments. That's how to do it. Rising early. Having the interest, the desire for the word of God, making haste so we can do what he has told us to do. And then we're looking at Acts of the Apostles, chapter 5. Acts, chapter 5. And we're looking there from verse 19. Acts, chapter 5. Verse 19. And the angel of the Lord by night opened the prison doors and brought them forth and said, Go stand and speak in the temple to the people all the words of this life. Go and stand in the temple and speak to them all the words of this life. And when they had that, they entered into the temple early in the morning. They heard that they were just imprisoned for preaching the word. And in the prison, the angel came upon them and said, come out of the prison. That's not your place. Go and preach all the words of this life. And immediately it says in early in the morning. They went there and they preached the word. That's what the Lord is expecting from us. You know this Joshua, the kind of obedience he gave unto the Lord. Number one, immediate obedience. No delay, no procrastination, no pushing forward. Immediate obedience. Number two, implicit obedience. Implicit obedience. Uh, the thing is like it's intact, instant. Implicit obedience. Number three, impeccable obedience. You cannot find any fault, any blame, any loophole in this obedience. Impeccable. 
The kind of obedience that Joshua had irreproachable, irreproachable obedience. You cannot reproach him if you have the mind of God, if you have the spirit of God. This man is irreproachable in his obedience. Immediate obedience, implicit obedience, impeccable obedience irreproachable obedience number five impressive obedience it impresses us isn't it impressing that this man joshua is a formidable task it's a great difficulty and then he just rises up he says my god is bigger than the mountain my god is greater even if it will claim my life here is what I will do because of the respect, the reverence, the honor that I have for this, my God. I'm going to obey him. I'm not going to be waiting and thinking it through and thinking it over. This is impressive, Joshua. And you know, there's another thing. Joshua, you teach me by what you have done. You instruct me by what you have done. Number six, instructive obedience. Instructive. You know, sometimes when you obey the Lord and your obedience becomes an instruction, an illustration, an encouragement, an influence on other people. And they say, you know what I learned from so and so. What I learned from him is that once he knows the mind of God, once he knows the will of God, he rises up early and he does it. And I'm praying that God will give me that same attitude of mind. Instructive, instructive obedience. Number seven, influential obedience. You're not going to be able to influence too many people who are under you if you're, if you're not obedient to the word of God. If you want to influence other people as a leader, just rise up and do what the Lord is revealing to us to do. Influential obedience. Number one, immediate. No delay. Number two, implicit. Just there. Total. Complete. Without decreasing, diminishing, detracting anything from it. Number three, impeccable. Number four, irreproachable. Number five, impressive. Number six, instructive. Number seven, influential. Now we're going to point number two. Reflections on the ark. Reflections on the ark. Before progress, I come to Joshua. Joshua chapter three. And we're reading from verse 2 now. Joshua chapter 3 verse 2. And it came to pass after three days. That the officers went through the host. And they commanded the people saying. When you see the ark of the covenant of the Lord your God. And the priest, the Levites bearing it. Then ye shall remove. From your place and go after it. Yet there shall be a space between you and it. About 2,000 cubits by measure. Come not near unto it. That ye may know the way by which ye must go. For ye have not passed this way heretofore. Now you know uh, what we have said. For them, it was not the rod. It was the ark. Have you noticed uh, churches? Have you noticed what they normally do? If um, the founder of the church, when God was leading him in the kindergarten of spiritual matters, God used objects. You know, that's how we teach. When you are fair, when you are still young, when you get into the kindergarten, and you are told, this is one. This is one. One plus one. You bring those two things together, and then you make the children count. They say, that is two. Then you say, one plus one is equal to two. And when you want to teach fraction, you take a sheet of paper, 
children. How many do I have in my hand? One. Then you cut it into two. You say, how many do I have now? They say two. How about this? One out of two. All right, children, write one over two. How about this? One out of two, right? One over two. Then you join them together. What does it become? One. Then you understand half plus half is equal to one. Kindergarten. And when God started with Moses, he had to use the object, the rod. What's there in your hand? A rod. Stretch it over the sea and it parted. Now Moses, my servant, is dead. Where is his rod? Everybody will be looking for, if I can just get the rod. And everywhere they go, here is River Jordan. Now they'll bring out the rod. That's what denominations do. When the Lord called their, uh, their founder, and that founder did not know much about the Bible. He was, he was using the truck. He was using the caterpillar. And then he didn't know who God was. And God wanted to help him to understand. And therefore he gave him a bell. And also gave him water. You will know that I am the God that is calling you. And then when, you know, anybody had stomach ache and he prayed on the water, they drank and they were healed. And then the water became a permanent thing. That even after that leader had gone, if you go to that place and you have stomach problem, they put the water in the bottle and then you drink. Why are you doing that? That's how our founder got it. But that's not a doctrine. I bought the bell. That's how he got it. And then now we rise up early in the morning. And then we're ringing the bell. Hear the word of the Lord. Why are you ringing the bell? Jesus never rang a bell. That's how our founder got it. That's how the bell came. But you know Joshua. The age of the rod is gone. Now the ark. Now the ark. The Ark of the Covenant. You know, people don't understand. And they just speak that same thing. And they do it forever without going back to the Bible. And that's why we're studying the Word of God here. And that's why if I tell you, no, don't do that. But we used to do it. Don't worry about that. Just listen. The time of the rod is gone. Now, you will look at the priests. And they will be bearing the ark. And you leave a space between you and them. And that space, in our calculation today, about half a mile. Why? Oh, because it has to be far away for the people to be able to see the priests that are bearing the ark. If it's too near, you only be looking at the back of the person in front of you. You'll not be able to see the ark. That's why they left the space. Because now you'll be led into the, into the rest through that ark. God will lead us. Numbers chapter 10, verse 33. Numbers chapter 10, verse 33. As we read Numbers chapter 10, verse 33, here's what it says. And they departed from Mount, from the Mount of the Lord three days journey. And the ark of the covenant of the Lord went before them in three days journey to search out a resting place for them. They should have known that. The ark went before them to search out a resting place for them. And so God told Joshua, I said, Joshua, tell the priests they will carry the Ark of the Covenant. That Ark of the Covenant. What do we understand by that today? You'll find in this chapter that is Joshua chapter 3. It is mentioned in chapters 3 and 4, 16 times. The Ark. And then it's referred to with a pronoun. As each. 
five times. That means then 21 times altogether. In these two chapters, chapters 3 and 4, this ark is mentioned. What do you know about the ark? The ark of the covenant contained, number one, the Ten Commandments, the moral law, the law of God. Number two, it contained the manna. And as you are thinking about that, it contained the word of God. And it contained the manna. Do you know your New Testament very well? In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God, and the word became flesh and dwelt among us. It's a symbol of Christ. About the manna, I am the bread that came from heaven. It's symbolizing Christ, that ark. And what they learned from that, keep on looking at the ark. If you want to get over to the other side, keep on looking on the ark. Fix your mind and your eyes and your attention on the ark. Let's go to Hebrews chapter 12. In Hebrews chapter 12, fixing your eyes on the ark, the ark of the covenant. In Hebrews chapter 12, we're looking at verse 2. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Who for the joy that was set before him in the other cross, despising the shame. And he sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. That's what the Lord is telling us then. He says, we should be looking. Looking at the ark. As we're moving on to divide the Jordan River. River Jordan. And you know, it's the priest that carried that ark. And going before them. That's a, a kind of illustration to us. That the ministers of Christ... The teachers and the guides of the people must reveal Christ to the people. So that the people, as they're looking, they will see Christ. Because you are bearing up the ark. You are bearing up the Christ. You are bearing up the one they should be looking at. And therefore, we we'll we'll bear Christ. And we must be in all things. All things as ministers of Christ set the example. Number one, in zeal for the master's cause. Let's see the zeal of Christ in your life. The zeal of thine house has consumed me. That's bearing the act before the people. Number two, we're going to be the example in unwearied efforts to spread the gospel. That's how to bear the ark. They learn the zeal from you. And they see the unwearied efforts in your life and in your ministry. Number three, impurity of life. That's how we bear the ark. That's how we show them Christ. Number four, in acts of love. Acts of love. Acts of love. That's how we bear Christ. Before the people, everything we do. Everything we say, every act of our hands, every ministry of service we render to the people of God in acts of love. Number five, in kindness to all. That's how we bear Christ. So that the people who are looking at us, they will not just, they'll see the act, they'll see Christ. They will see the acts of kindness or the kindness to all. They will see the truth. We we'll bear him up in truth. Our lives reflecting the truth. Our lives demonstrating the truth. Our lives impressing people with the truth. Number seven, imprudence, wisdom. In every act that you know how to act, how to live, how to influence people. Imprudence in wisdom. Then number eight, in self-denial. Self-denial. That you are bearing up Christ. And you are demonstrating, you are showing, you are revealing the very life of Christ unto the people. That's the significance of bearing the ark. Then we'll come back now to Joshua. We're looking at Joshua chapter 3 verse 5. Joshua chapter 3 
Verse 5. You see, it was the priest that bore the ark. It was the priest that carried the ark. Now the people, in verse 5, Joshua chapter 3, verse 5. And Joshua said unto the people, notice that. Joshua said, not only unto the priest, now, now all the people, the priests are part of the people, but the priests are not all the people. But now, here is the command. And Joshua said unto all, unto the people, sanctify yourselves for tomorrow. The Lord will do wonders among you. Sanctify yourselves for tomorrow. The Lord will do wonders among you. If they were going to have this supernatural breakthrough, if they were going to experience this impossible, incredible scene, if they were going to have this great exploit, sanctify yourselves for tomorrow. The Lord will do great wonders among you. Will do wonders among you. Point number three, readiness for exploits through purity. Readiness for exploits through purity. Now that word, sanctify. Sanctify. You need to think about it. Not only think about it, you need to do something about it. Because Joshua said, sanctify yourselves in readiness for the great exploit. In readiness for what the Lord will do in your midst. And don't delay it. Because delaying it will delay the wonders. This is antecedent. A prerequisite. A condition. Something that comes before. The wonders. The exploits. The supernatural breakthrough. It must come before. If you delay it, you delay your wonders. If you delay it, you delay the breakthrough. Sanctify yourselves so that tomorrow the Lord will do wonders among you. If you're expecting a great display of God's power, people, sanctify yourselves. If you're expecting an unprecedented manifestation of God's glory, Sanctify yourselves. If you're expecting a repetition of spectacular miracles done for our forefathers, because you see, many of these people that Joshua was talking to, they were not born at the time of the Red Sea. You know that the people that were above 40 years, they have all died in the wilderness, except Joshua and Caleb. This is a new generation. They were born after they passed through the Red Sea. Here is Jordan before us. And Joshua could have told them, like John the Beloved, he could have said, little children. Because they were born in the wilderness. They had not seen a lot of the miracles, especially the dividing of the Red Sea. He could have said, children, did you hear how the Red Sea was divided. Did you hear about that spectacular miracle done for our forefathers? Yes, we have heard. If you want to see a similar thing, the dividing of the Red Sea, now the dividing of River Jordan, sanctify yourselves so that tomorrow the Lord will do that great wonder in your midst. If you want the formidable obstacle between you and the promised land to be removed, sanctify yourselves. Now the word sanctify, you understand by now, your leaders here, has two different shades of meaning. There's a divine side to sanctification. There is a human side to sanctification. And you know these people, these were children of Israel. These were people of God. 
These were people who have come out of Egypt. You know, in Egypt, when they were still over there, there was no sanctify yourself. But these people have come out of Egypt. They have gone through the water of the Red Sea. They have gone through the baptism, water baptism. They have come to this side of the wilderness. And they have come to this side of the baptism of the Red Sea. And they have been eating the manna. Man shall live. Not by bread alone, but by every word that proceeded out of the mouth of God. They are eating the manna already. I am the manna, the bread come from heaven. These are saved people. But now, after the salvation, sanctify yourselves. And you'll find in many passages of scripture, how you are to do it yourself. The human side, the human part, the human duty, the human responsibility, what you are to do concerning your sanctification. Second Corinthians chapter 7 verse 1, the human side. In 2 Corinthians chapter 7, reading from verse 1. I mean, therefore, dearly, uh, these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves. You see, we do that ourselves. That's our part in sanctification. From all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 verse 22. Abstain from all appearance of evil. That's what you do for yourself. Sanctify yourselves. In Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 31. Ezekiel 18. And I'm reading from verse 31. Ezekiel 18, verse 31. Cast away from you. That's what you do. All your transgressions, whereby you have transgressed, Make you a new heart. That's what you do. Make it. Do it. Act it out. Decide it. Carry it out. Make you a new heart and a new spirit. For why will ye die, O house of Israel? That's what you do yourself. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 16. What you do in this area of sanctification. Deuteronomy chapter 10, verse 16. Circumcise therefore the first skin of your heart and be no more stiff-necked. That's personal decision. I'll not be stubborn anymore. I will not be self-willed anymore. I will not be stiff-necked anymore. That's personal decision. Make up your mind on that. That's your own part of the sanctification. Isaiah chapter 52. I'm reading from verse 11. Isaiah 52. From verse 11. Departure, departure. Go ye out from this. Touch no unclean sin. Go ye out of the midst of her. Be ye clean that bear the vessels of the Lord. You do it yourself. That's your part. Then in Romans chapter 12. Romans chapter 12. Verses 1 and 2. In Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. That's what you do. You present it to the Lord. And be not conformed to this world. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. That's the human side. Sanctify yourselves. Now, there's a divine side. That's what God does in our sanctification. What's that? He cleanses us. He makes us holy. He purifies our heart. As a response to our prayer, a prayer of consecration, it makes our heart purged whiter than snow. Look at this. This is what God now does in Psalm 51. Psalm 51, 
reading from verse 7. In Psalm 51, verse 7, here is the part of God. Purge me. This is not what you do for yourself. This is what God does. And I shall be clean. Wash me. And I shall be whiter than snow. That's God's part. He washes us. He cleanses us. He purges us until not just we're as white as snow. We're whiter than snow. It tells us in Ezekiel chapter 36. I read Ezekiel to you in chapter 18. Now, chapter 36. And we're looking at verse 26. In the other area, it said, make you a new heart. Make you a new spirit. But here now, it says, what he will do. This is God's part. Ezekiel, chapter 36, verse 26. A new heart also will I give you. And a new spirit. In the other, on the other side, chapter 18. Make you a new heart. Do that yourself. And make you a new spirit. Do that yourself. Do your part. And now God comes to his own part of that sanctification. A new heart also will I give you. And a new spirit will I put within you. I will take away the stony heart out of your flesh. And I will give you an heart of flesh. Deuteronomy chapter 30 verse 6. We read Deuteronomy chapter 10 before. Where it says, you will circumcise your own heart. And you'll not be stiff-necked anymore. But now, here is what God will do concerning our circumcision. He tells us in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 6. And the Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart. You see, there's a human part. And there's a divine side to this sanctification. The Lord thy God will circumcise thine heart and the heart of thy seed to love the Lord thy God with all thine heart and with all thy soul that thou mayest live. First John chapter 1 verse 7. First John chapter 1. Reading there in verse 7. But if we walk in the light... As he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us. Cleanses us from all sin. If we confess in verse 9 our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins, the salvation. And to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, the inbred sin, that sanctification, it does that. And it's the one that does that. In Titus chapter 2, verse 14. Titus 2, verse 14. The divine side of sanctification. Who gave himself for us. That he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people. Purify. To purify the heart. To cleanse the heart. To purge the heart. To make the heart holy. So holy. So pure. Whiter than snow. And Jesus gave himself in a perfect sacrifice to get that done. To accomplish that. That he might redeem us from all iniquity and purify unto himself a peculiar people, zealous of good works. In Jeremiah chapter 31 verse 33. Jeremiah chapter 31. We're looking at verse 33. Here is a work of the Lord. What he says he will do is sanctifying us. Jeremiah chapter 31 verse 33. But this shall be the covenant that will make or the house of Israel after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law in their inward parts. That's sanctification. I will put my law in their inward parts. 
and write it in their hearts and will be their God and they shall be my people. They will be my, they will be my people. I will be their God. I'll put my law in their hearts. In what parts? Sanctification. What God does. First Thessalonians chapter 3 verse 12. In First Thessalonians chapter 3, reading from verse 12 and verse 13, the Lord make you, this is the work of the Lord, the Lord make you to increase in love one to another, one toward another, and toward all men, even as we do toward you, to the end for the purpose, for this reason, he, that he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness, unblameable in holiness, so that your obedience will all the time be immediate. Your obedience will all the time be implicit. Your obedience will all the time be impeccable. Your obedience will be impressive, instructive, influential. And when it sanctifies you, then the way you act and the way you respond to the word of God, it will show. To the end, he may establish your hearts unblameable in holiness before God. Even our Father, at the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, with all his saints. First Thessalonians chapter 5, from verse 22. Abstain from all appearance of evil. That's your part. Now the part of God and the very God of peace. Sanctify you holy. And I pray God... It says, I pray God, your whole spirit and soul and body be preserved blameless unto the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. Verse 24, faithful is he that calleth you who also will do it. He will do it. As you think about this, and it says we need to prepare for a supernatural breakthrough. You see, this vacation says it all. You have a part to play. And God has a significant part to play. And this is the condition of going through the river Jordan. Overcoming the formidable obstacles so we can get ahead to the supernatural breakthrough. Leviticus chapter 20 verses 7 and 8. Bringing both the human side of sanctification and the divine side of sanctification, bringing them together in those in these two verses, Leviticus chapter twenty, reading from verse seven and verse eight. Sanctify yourselves, sanctify yourselves. The beginning of verse seven, at the end of verse eight, I am the Lord. Which sanctify you. At the beginning of verse 7. Sanctify yourselves. Human part. Your own part. Your personal responsibility. And at the end of verse 8. I am the Lord. Which sanctify you. We are preparing for a breakthrough. We are preparing for the impossible. For the incredible. We are preparing for something that people have never heard of this year is going to be a special year but how and Joshua rose early in the morning if you will make this year a year of rising up in the morning and do what the Lord has called you to do and Joshua rose early in the morning and they removed from shitting come out your stage in that situation for too long a time. You stayed in this comfort zone. Doing your own will. Doing your own thing. Going your own way. This is a new year. Come out of shitting. And let's move on. Don't look back at the wilderness. What we did last year. How we did it last year. Look up. And see the horizon. And see what's before you. And get out of the shittim. And come to Jordan. He and all the children of Israel. And then they looked before. They passed over. And then he now said. Priests. Levites. Carry the ark. 
carry it high above your shoulders and move on in front of the people take the ark symbolizing christ lift up christ show christ don't show the adamic nature don't show him bread sin don't show our tribal peculiarities show the ark if you show us your tribal peculiarities will never cross jordan if you show us the demonstration of the inbred sin will never cross jordan lift up the ark and let everybody see christ represented by the ark because we're crossing this jordan i said we're crossing this jordan and now to all the people, all the people, go and tell our people back at home. The supernatural will come when all our people get the message of sanctification. Sanctification is not just for the priest carrying the ark. And Joshua said unto the people, go back home and tell them it's a year of holiness. This year is a year of sanctification. This year is a year of purity. This year is a year when we bury the old man. And then when all the people understand, sanctify yourselves. Then we can tell the church, because this year the Lord is going to do great, great wonders among you in Jesus' name. Rise up now and get yourself ready. Rise up and prepare yourself. The Lord wants to do great things. The Lord wants to do great things. The Lord wants to do great things. Preparation for a supernatural breakthrough. Preparation for a supernatural breakthrough. The Lord is calling you. And the Lord is impressing it on us. This is what you do. Let's move on. Let's move forward. Don't stay in the wilderness for so long. You know what kept them in the wilderness? Let's move on. So we can get to the promised land. In Jesus' name we pray. And everybody said... Heavenly Father, we bless your name. We thank you for the revelation of your word once again. We thank you, Lord, on your side you are ready to take your people over to cross over this Jordan. This seemingly insurmountable problem and this seemingly impassable road to get to the great theme that you are preserved for your people. You are ready. And we know that Christ has made all the sacrifice that will ever be done. The final sacrifice. The perfect sacrifice. So as to cleanse us, purge us, purify us, sanctify us, make us holy, make us whiter than snow. So we can cross this our own Jordan and get to that land of delight. That land of pleasure. That land of wonders. That land beauty of all beauty so lord we know you are ready everything is available and we're asking oh lord you'll make every one of us ready in jesus name all the delay on our path cancel it lord all the procrastination on our path cancel it lord and all the pulling down the downward pull of the adamic nature the downward pull of the stiff neck and the downward pull of the bad habit of just lowing down not responding immediately oh lord crush it and cancel it out of our lives in jesus name make this time the time of breaking from the past and moving into the future that lord this impassable river before your people will divide again will pass over we'll get to the other side 
and we'll see the glory, the beauty of the great work of the Lord in our lives and for the people of God in Jesus' name. As the people of God are moving on and passing over, oh Lord, we pray, we'll not be left behind. In the case of the children of Israel, every one of them did what you told them to do and they sanctified themselves. They prepared themselves and they moved on. We're praying, oh Lord, none of us will be left behind in Jesus' name. And your promise of breakthrough. Your promise of signs and wonders. Your promise of great exploits. Effect and accomplish for the whole church in Jesus' name. We accept it. We count it done. We shall see it. We shall be alive to witness it. Make it ours this very time in Jesus' name. We thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. A new year. Amen. If you want me to release you for your seminars now, give me a good amen before you go. Thank you very much. This year for you will be a new year. A year of breakthrough. You'll never be the same again in Jesus' name. Be united with the body of Christ and let that stiff neck, let it pass over. And